Good afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for Brian Rago's Artist Talk. My name is Lillian Day Thorpe, and I'm a director of Nancy Margolis Gallery. Today, Brian is going to speak with artist and educator Scott Knoll about the paintings in his current exhibition, Reasons I Stay. Many of you know Brian personally or have been following his practice, but for those who don't, he lives and works in Charleston, South Carolina. He earned his MFA from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in 2007 and went on to co-found the painting collective known as Perceptual Painters. In 2022, his work was published in the book, Art in the Making, Essays by Artists About What They Do. And last year, Brian was the recipient of the Blackwell Prize in Painting from the University of Georgia. Our moderator, Scott Knoll, is a Philadelphia-based painter who has been the subject of more than 40 solo exhibitions throughout his career. He is a tenured professor at Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and it was here at PAFA where Brian and Scott first met when Brian was Scott's student in the MFA program. Brian, I, I think, you know, I, I wanted to, I, I've spent a lot of time the last, you know, couple of days really looking through your work that is available to me online. And, you know, I noticed there are some large paintings from, you know, over the last, you know, three or four years. Um, like I found one in from 2015, 16 backyard at Woodrow Street and then maybe from 2017 called Flyboy, which are sort of in this scale range, which I think is a little bit larger than you usually were. But I, uh, but I also, uh, also think there's something that captures a lot of your practice in this large painting. So for me, it's a really interesting picture to look at and, um, and try to sort of unpack a little bit. And, uh, and I think I, I, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, talk about it a little bit in terms of its, uh, you know, what's what's happening in the picture. And I think uh, on the one, you know, on the simplest level, you, you, it seems like there's a fairly uh, kind of straightforward moment in in you know the life of the world that the picture portrays. But there's such a complex form of embodiment. Uh, uh, about everything that's going on. And I think for all the painters that are probably out there looking at this, we we, we might all be able to agree on a whole bunch of uh, interesting, uh, I guess, things that the picture brings into view. Uh, maybe one of them for me would be uh, this strange sense of sympathy between things that's registered in the various shapes that one finds in the picture. The most obvious ones would probably be something about, say, the figures and their silhouettes uh, measured against the clouds in the sky. But if you look a little bit longer, that just keeps on percolating because, you know, on the asphalt street, there's a, or the asphalt parking lot, there's a way in which that surface is phrased that almost mirrors the sky. And when you're looking at, say, the uh, the wall of the larger of the two buildings, deeper in space, something's going on with the uh, the masonry that seems to deeply uh, echo uh, uh, the silhouettes of the figures. So I, I guess I, you know, just because I'm curious, and we haven't talked intimately about your painting, you know, probably since you know. Uh, for many years, even though I know you're painting very well. I wondered if you could say anything about what, how you understand the painting, like what it means to you. First off, uh, Scott, I just want to thank you for um, agreeing to, to moderate today's talk. Uh, this is such a great honor for me to have this type of conversation with you. Um, and it is, I, I feel, um, I would like to have more and, and I, I, I have to say that um, I take responsibility for the time that has passed. And you know, between us, without having these types of conversations, I feel like my work would have benefited much greater, much more if if we had. So, so thank you for for talking today. 
Um, and, and Lillian, thank you so much for all of the effort and the work that you've put into making all of this come about. Uh, you've offered a lot of support um, and a lot of patience and understanding. So thank you. <clears throat> um, Scott, you know, you said some incredible things. Uh, I love what you said um, about the conflict, complex form of embodiment and the strange sympathy between things. Um, that's certainly, I mean, you know, that's a level of sensitivity that I think is is paramount for for sort of picking up on the subtlety of, I think, what's happening just in terms of the way that the visual elements are behaving uh, and expressing themselves in relationship to one another. Um, I do think of, and I think many painters <clears throat> may perhaps approach it this way too, I think of the the entire painting as its own form, right? And it's sort of um, this way. This and this, it's a form that can sort of move and and vacillate. Um, and uh, you know, and depending upon the sympathy of the viewer and and what they're able to to, to engage with in the painting, and what uh, depending on where they are, what the painting is able to reveal you know, at, at a time, you know, per, per session is to me something that is very surprising, even for myself as I make these paintings. Um, so when I come to an understanding of how, say, for example, the, the development of a surface or the parking lot, um, the way that that's realized in relationship to the sky, <clears throat> that is something that I kind of arrive at unknowingly. Um, you know, it's almost sort of, I, I guess I'm kind of being guided by some some intuitive sense where I, I know things that I try because, you know, that that parking lot went through a lot of different iterations and there were, there were versions that I think would have worked in a different context, but for reasons that at the time were unknown to me, I, I didn't uh, allow them to remain. I just took them out or painted over them and I didn't really know why. I just knew that it, it wasn't quite right. <clears throat> and that I would say is probably the most exciting and difficult part of developing paintings that, that happens in every painting that I make where the process is largely unknown to me, except for the fact that I can expect it to be unknown as I go through the process of making each painting that I make. Because a lot of the time, even though I start on location and like we were talking about, just I respond um, as any painter does on location, just trying to stay above water, right? Or learning how to hold your breath underwater. It, there's this kind of just um, feverish responsiveness that happens. Um, and it's not so, it's not so much analytical, right? Uh, but back in the studio, things have a chance to breathe and to really sort of slow down in, in a sense. Um, and I can, I can orient myself to the painting in a very different way. And, and I approach the painting as, as of course the subject. And as, as I'm making decisions that are, that are largely intuitive, um, they seem to accumulate and, um, and begin to form a narrative you know uh, in the painting and sometimes it takes me a, it, it takes me time you know a good amount of time to understand where the painting is going like, like where it wants to go in a sense because it you know when i try to force something to happen it's like it's a, an, a it's a complete disaster <clears throat> so i have to i have to wait until there's an understanding where if something emerges whether it's a, a visual image of a figure or an expression of a color, a shape or a form um, that feels right. It, it really seems to just feel right. And then I'll, I'll, I'll work to paint it in. Well, the, that, go but, ahead. But the relationship say between like like the parking lot in the sky, for example, or the masonry work and the figures and the and the poses that they're taking, there is there is a a continuity of 
movement that I'm very interested in um, in the forms that, that, are, that are being built, but also the spaces between those forms. You know, <clears throat> um, I remember looking at Courbet and like sensing his invisible forms in the paintings, these like invisible forms that are like, that are beyond the, the representation of the image. You know, there's, there's like, you've got those forms that are like academic, but, but the, the real, the real form of the painting is, is the way that the space, the form of the space in the painting is, is moving and sort of unveiling itself. Um, and, and I, I feel like his decisions were very much guided by the way he was interpreting the movement of those forms um, in relation to what he was representing. And, and that's, that's how I'm approaching that and in, in these paintings as well. It just seems to fit my temperament as a painter, you know, and a lot of, so long story short, I'm being very long winded here. I apologize, but essentially I make decisions without really knowing why that I'm, I'm making them until the very, very end, it, things begin to make sense. And it's only after I've been looking at it for a long time and really trying to understand in a way what's going on that I begin to see these kind of, as you said, um, like these strange sympathies between things, um, these strange sympathetic states, you know, and, and when that happens, I, I work, to develop those um so that that's really terrific answer because i think you pointed me and everyone else towards something that's kind of counterintuitive for folks looking at say representational art which is this idea that there's a form life that is functioning kind of slightly on its own track uh, relatives to say the imagery is it, it the only way I can kind of understand that was you gave me a clue a couple of days ago you said that you had formed long after your education you had formed a little uh, you'd entered into a conversation with Gabriel Lotterman and uh, you said that Gabriel Lotterman I understood you to say had had really been kind of crucial to you in terms of sort of uh, challenging you to something that maybe you hadn't even been fully aware of uh uh and um and you know it's funny Lotterman was somebody that I never met but uh I know a couple of painters who he meant a great deal to uh, uh Lincoln Perry and uh Michael Ananian and you know they would speak of him as a very challenging but deeply supportive guy and uh and it made me think back to Lotterman's pictures, which I didn't, I, I like your paintings more than I liked uh, Gabriel's, frankly, but I, I really came to admire them, respect them. And, um, and I remember looking at some of his still lifes and watching the way he would paint the wall between some objects and the almost infinity of distinctions he would make between one object and another when you know I, I was kind of wondering why he did that you know it was almost like Zeno's arrow where he would divide the space so many times that you could never quite arrive at the thing that you were you know uh, uh, depicting one thing to another and I'm really aware of that a little bit looking at school day is the painting really breathes in terms of its color and I think what I might call the gesture of the depicted forms, but the intervals, I think that's what I understand you to be talking about, the spaces between things, have a weird way of slowing the time in the pictures. The, de the, the depicted time is, is, uh, is a quite a different thing from the felt time of the forms. Does that make any sense to you or am I way off? No, no, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm listening to you talk about it in a way that I wish I always could, but I haven't just developed the vocabulary to do that. And so I'm, I'm really excited to hear you say something like that because that is exactly, I think that's, that's, I mean, that is exactly dead on. <clears throat> I, I haven't been able to articulate that, but that is exactly dead on. Um, 
Well, let me ask you a little follow up to that, uh, if if you don't mind, because I'm yeah. curious, personally curious. You know, when I when I first met you, and often when I meet any you know talented young painter, there's usually a fairly innocent and very direct connection to painting and the world. Those things seem to almost be deeply, uh, you know, like just intuitively seamless in some way. And then as you go deeper into your your own experience and your relationship to painting, things get more complicated. And, and it sounds like, you know, Lotterman was a complicating factor for you, probably much more than I was. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and I just wonder if you could say anything about what you understood from him, like, you know, like what he, you know, how he got in your head in some way. Um, I think it was, it was his, well, so we, we had a, we had a few, um, correspondences back and forth, you know, via email and something that I, I kind of, I, I came away with, um, from those correspondences, uh, was just how, how resourceful he was and how much he really understood painting in a way that was so far beyond, so, so far beyond where I was. Um, but at the same time, he had such a, a, a tenderness and such a care about it. Um, but he also was, he was also very, um, how can I say it, compassionately brutal, you know, <laughs> right? And, and, uh, in the in his positions um for good reason I, I think he really understood the kind of painter that he was um and he 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 was able to identify um the type of painting that in his mind was was good painting um and i, I think he had developed the reasons why um <clears throat> Some were, of course, objective, and others were were much more subjective. But I think what what I what mattered the most to me, and and a lot of things mattered, but what stood out, I think, in my personal growth was just his level of displeasure with with what I was making, um, because he wasn't he wasn't um, unkind, right, and and he wasn't um, you know, mean or anything like that. He was, he was as as sincere and uh, transparent as he could be. Um, and he's and it's it's his phrasing that that even though at the time I didn't I didn't know enough to understand what he meant by what he said, and I'll I'll say that in just a second. But it was much much later on that I was able to look back. Um, and understand what he meant. And I would say that was a, a that happened a good bit as well um, to the critics and different conversations I had, including ones with you too, Scott, where I would look back, um, you know, my time in graduate school and, and things finally began to make sense because at the time they were just way over my head. Gabriel, he said, um, that my work the paintings were too easy hmm. um he said i was giving everything away um and yeah at the time i i wasn't thinking about painting the way that i'm thinking about it now so i didn't quite understand i didn't really understand what he meant by that but it was it was sort of uh right before a time of transition that i that i began to have as a painter where my orientation towards the world and and the visual experience and how I thought about that um, and even how I would look at paintings um, would would change and and change dramatically and, and change so much so that I I had to stop painting the way that I was painting before and start complete I had to start, I had to start over again. Um, and so my, the paintings that I made early, early on post grad school were, um, they were very, they were, they were very unsophisticated, very simple. 
uh, and, and kind of, um, I, I tried to reduce it as much as I possibly could to just the bare essential, you know, <clears throat> and, and I had to slowly build up from there very slowly. Um, and then I worked only from observation. I, you know, I hadn't developed yet the ability to work from memory and incorporate, you know, conjuring of images and things like that. I, I didn't know enough about color or, or, you know, paint handling or anything like that. I had to just work, keep working. And I worked from observation exclusively for years, for years, yeah. um, you know, and, and it's really because, you know, having four children, you can't just go out and spend three hours, four hours in the field. Like you get maybe an hour and a half and it's like, you're not, you're not painting yet after an hour and a half. It's like, you need to at least two hours to, to warm up and kind of get into the painting, you know? And, and then it's yeah. like, painting. <clears throat> so, so I, I've, I had to sort of by default, if I were going to keep making paintings, I had to rely on a, on a different system, a different method, a different way of, of, of doing it. And uh, so that's, that's when I began to cultivate visual memory, began to ask myself questions about, about the painting itself, right? And, and, and allowing the painting to slowly emerge and become the subject, as opposed to what I was working from, you know, like outside in the landscape. Wow, that, that, that's a fantastic answer. Um, that that gave me a lot because I think, you know, I was asked. I've, you know, I know you to be a kind of committed, you know, sort of plein air observation based painter, but these paintings are not simply that. And and you know, we were talking a little bit about you know what maybe what the balance between memory, invention, and observation might be. And um, I mean, just say taking school day for an example, you know, how would you kind of factor, you know, the, the different domains of your painting experience, you know, informing a major work like this? Well, for, for one thing, I, I would say that the, I would say the most important thing is the is the color um, right and specifically specifically in the midtones um and how how I, I work to sort of move through like the temperature shifting and the chromatic shifting in the midtones you know scott what i was when i was taking from you as a student you know you had shared with us like such a, a profound love and dedication to to working into to sort of like finding this this observable color and and then from there kind of cultivating a sort of a poetic sensibility with that color and and sort of seeing where it can go um in relation to to, to other colors and, and the color form of the painting right and and I see that played out, you know, and and painters like Cezanne, um, Piero della Francesca, and 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 those those painters, especially when I see what they're doing in the midtones, Corot, you know, like it, it sort of gave me, I think, a, a place because because it that ignited my sensibilities, you know, even though I wasn't able to do it at the time. I began working towards that. Um, so, so I would say that is is paramount for making a painting, whether it's like large or big. But the difference with it being big that I'm finding um, is that the way that a form is developed requires more, um, more well, more relationships, more elements within that form. Um, you know, I, I admire, I admire, I've always admired painters that can develop, that can paint really big and have these brilliant color forms that are just so large and so vast and that are able to, they're able to, to justify their scale and their presence within the image. 
um, almost effortlessly. Um, as if to say, like, challenge me, I dare you, right? And and I can't paint like that. <clears throat> um, I wish I could, but I the a lot of times I I I find that I don't quite know how to paint something. Um, and so the, the like the shifting, like the very subtle and meticulous shifts that occur really sort of are the result of me working to understand exactly what it is I'm painting. And so it, it moves from like a literary sense to one that is more, um, much more abstract. Um, so I'm not just painting like a grass hill, you know, or a figure. It's like I'm painting a movement um, that needs to be articulated at, at sort of this way, at this velocity, at this speed. And I need it to engage with, you know, this other form, we can call it the brick wall, right? And I need those forms to engage in a way where they're beginning to affect each other and, and affect even, even the, the visual representation of, of that form, uh, which look at the masonry, like the masonry work on that building, it, it sort of like moves in, it like moves back and moves in under the window. And it's like a it's a response to that hill, you know. But it, it it but it's also part of a larger movement. It's part of a larger movement, like the the curb, um, for example. And just above that figure that's sort of pressed into that small hillside where the grass is, you know, to the one where, in the sort of greenish grass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. And and her the way she's angled uh in a way that the the angle of where the grass meets the wall to where the concrete is that little concrete pad there's this sort of movement that occurs there but it's it's fast but it's subdued it's like subtle so then it's it becomes slow and you know the angles are, are dynamic and there's like a rushing in that sense but then all of a sudden it slows because because the colors is slow the color is very slow in those areas, um, and you be you can get like really get into those those subtle shifts, and then the forms slowly begin to expand, and 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 they grow, and so the space which appears at once flat begins to expand, and and become bigger, um, and there's more, and all of a sudden there becomes more space in between forms, uh, which something that I, I really appreciate you know say like for bonard or different painters that are able to compress and expand space simultaneously um so i would say like color which allows me to do things like that spatially and then again you know this this painting in particular was a very big problem for me because before that figure uh in the blue shirt with the white cap before that figure was painted in you can imagine the problem of of this division that occurred between like the upper part of the painting and the lower part of the painting through that curb. Yeah, it's really you know kind of aggressive movement, and and I had an arrangement of figures that were different beforehand that uh, it just wasn't quite working. Um, but he was painted in, in in a, in a session, and as soon as that he, as soon as he was in there, I was able to understand. What, what the form of the painting needed um, to kind of carry along the idea of the space further. Um, and so that that was something where, you know, this painting almost didn't, it almost didn't make it. You know, I mean, how many times has that happened as a painter? It's like, you know, you paint yourself into a problem that you don't have, uh, you know, uh, an answer for, there's no resolution for it. You're just like, ah, oh, shoot, like, you know, um, but for whatever time, for whatever it's worth, however, however much material that goes into it, you keep working at it and finally something emerges um, that hopefully it isn't forced, you know, that comes up, that feels natural um, and very much a part integrated with, with the painting. That's what this figure did for me uh, for this painting. And it allowed me to move then to other, other moments. Um, 
Yeah, I, you can really see that. Yeah, yeah. I I almost you know now that you're speaking of it, you know, you almost feel like the painting is for that figure. I mean, uh, that figure is just so such a beautiful invention uh, that it seems to be the kind of almost like the 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 locus of feeling in the picture. Uh, you know, the, uh, which I I think is is a painter i know exactly what you're talking about there's this funny way in which certain things almost become inevitable but they arrive like as gifts or something. Yeah. Yeah. which if you're not used to that feeling as most civilians are you know you just feel you're you're not sure you know what just happened you know <laughs> what, what what was that you know um, let me just you know step a little bit more into what I would call a civilian perception of things a little bit, because I, I'm fascinated by, you know, the kind of painterly unpacking of the language of your work. And, and I find it really convincing. I mean, I, I see it, I know, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, completely persuaded, but I was wondering, I, I'm not sure, that of purely formal analysis of your pictures does them justice, you know, because although I, I will say you have, you, if somebody heard you without looking at your pictures, they really wouldn't know what they were about. You know, they would know, well, this, this painterly poet has a very strong allegiance to what you might call the life of painting in a capital P sense, in the same way a poet or a, or a writer might have a deep allegiance to language. You're talking about language in some way, but you're also talking about language as adequacy to certain kinds of experience. And in painterly terms, that would be light and space, I guess. Um, but the paintings are even more than that. I mean, if I look at all of the work that I can see, you know, over the last you know, 10 years or so, it really looks like there's, you're, you're driven by something that has a lot to do with memory and place. And uh, I would even argue something about time, the experience of time uh, that, uh, and you did use the word literary very briefly a few minutes ago. And I, and I wonder if you could talk about that that texture of experience in your work, where the images come from. Uh, and, you know, maybe later on we can get back to how that then seeks a form uh, in your pictures. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you for, for bringing up that uh, point of distinction. I, I think that's important. Um, <sighs> So when I was when I was married, um, when when I was when I got married, uh, twenty years ago, uh, Lizzie and I just celebrated our twenty anniversary, which is very exciting. Um, thank you. Um, on the day that I got married, I had I had uh, my undergraduate painting professor, um, who was so important for me, um, as as just getting into painting. Uh, you know, he, he, he and his wife came to, to our wedding and, uh, after, you know, for the ceremony, everything afterwards, the reception, um, you know, he, he came up to me and he said, you know, just paint your life. You know, uh, I may have made a flippant comment like, well, I don't know what I'm going to paint now, you know, school, I was, I had graduated, all this kind of stuff. But he said, he said in a very serious way, he said, paint your life, just paint your life. <clears throat> and that was one of the things that, um, you know, I didn't exactly understand what he meant at the time, but, but I carried that with me. And I would say as, as I, as I, as I lived on from like a very early kind of young adult, um, I was 23 at the time when I got married you know, as, as life, you know, happens and sort of unveils itself and you have, you're met with such uh, a surprising um, 
get universal, you know, uh, degree of suffering and tragedy and uh, and wonder, wonderful things, inspire awe, you know, and joy, um, um, and 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 pain, right? And and all of these things are are not, I think something that i can paint um literally you know i have to paint them more figuratively and I, I need to find a way to express that you know i i because i'm more introverted in a sense i and i hold a lot inside i hold a lot inside um emotionally and things like that i need outlets i need ways to work through you know, um, my feelings about uh, life, about relationships, loss, gain, um, victories and defeats, and, you know, the whole thing, the whole arena, the whole arena, and uh, my spirituality, right, and, and all this. And painting, as I began to develop as a painter, <clears throat> I found that I was able to begin using using the, the the process of painting developing imagery to to start articulating uh, visually these experiences um but I, I found that i had to do it in a way that was much more symbolic um for example the the figure in in school day this one that's so central um I didn't know this until after I painted it. I had painted the figure in. I painted the little boy. So I painted him in. And uh, I had to go somewhere, I think, to pick up my boy from school. And as I was leaving, I, I, I just happened to look over at the painting and, and it hit me like so profoundly strong. It just hit me. It was clear and sharp. Um, like that figure is my grandfather. And I'm that little boy. You know, and um, my grandfather had had passed um, somewhat unexpectedly uh, during a surgery, and and I was very close to him, and um, we used to have such such wonderful and inspiring discussions about life um, and science and philosophy. He was he was a neat person, with a very very beautiful mind. Um, and so when when we when when we lost him and he and he reposed, you know, there was this this uh I was met with with this surprising sort of desire to hear his voice again. I just wanted to hear his voice again, or I wanted to have just one more conversation. You know, so <clears throat> this was a way for me to um he, he also he played the guitar. And, and growing up as a child, I loved it. And I, I developed the ability to play the guitar as well. And, you know, I still do and write music and things like that. Um, but these are ways that I pay homage to them. Uh, these are ways that I'm able to infuse the paintings with my personal experiences, my feelings, very strong, you know, very strong emotions. Um, and I'm able to to put them into the painting, but I I do it in such a way. Um, I think one to preserve the the element of privacy, um, because I know that these paintings will be seen, you know, by other people. Um, so, or or even maybe autonomy in a sense, where I can I can have more space, you know, even though I'm putting all of myself into the work there's a degree of autonomy where the painting can just function as its own uh, and, and, and become whatever it needs to be for, for the viewer. Um, so <clears throat> that, uh, that, I, that I would say is, is, is sort of where the, the content, the meaning, the narrative comes from, you know, but I, when I, when I choose the titles for the work, I, I, I want the title to be something that is able to address the painting in a way that doesn't necessarily 
tell you what it's about in a, in, in a sense, but it it's sort of um, maybe it's sort of like an extension of it, you know, uh, just in terms of content, like conceptually. Um, so school day, but obviously for me, it's about many, many other things, many other things. Um, but it yeah. but yeah. it allows to function as it needs to, you know, um, in a more neutralized state. And then hopefully it, it activates and becomes something for the viewer, like on their terms. Right. Yeah, well, I think that's maybe, uh, you know, one of the strange alchemies of, of great poetry is on some level, you've made something very, very specific. And yet there's also something in, in, in that, achievement that's very self-effacing that allows another's experience to be confirmed in the work you know like i might just for interest sake since this is a major very hard one picture maybe even a kind of outlier it might be fun to go to uh, a picture like uh you know girl among flowers i don't know that lillian yeah yeah oh no no actually go to the, the one right before that no that one yeah, that this one? no, yeah, a walk in the park. Because yeah. I was looking at that one as something maybe. Well, I, I you know I just was again I I kept trying to sort of wrap my my mind around uh, you know uh, how evocative the picture is, and again since I'm a kind of perceptual painter, I kept thinking well you know th these must be you know, partly, you know, uh, phrases in the paint that are stimulated by things that you see, but then, you know, uh, nobody but you would, I think, have come up with those particular, uh, j those phrases for the foliage and the kind of strange merger of the, of the girl in the foreground with the, uh, uh, those shadows and i noticed something that you do quite a bit which is this this sense of gesture that i think derives from the figure that seems to play out in the landscape it's as if i can often find a figure that maybe at first you want to construe as an actor within a stage but then i start winding up thinking the, the space is issuing from that figure in a weird way like there's a picture of a, I think it's called a swim lesson. Maybe Lillian, we could see that for just a second. Um, where you know, uh, there's something about the 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 interaction of the the woman and the child, I guess mother and child, that out of which a lot of the picture begins to kind of echo, like the way her body is merged with the the slats of the bench, and then that kind of haliation of the shimmering water beyond the figure that almost seems to be you know like fields of force that are reacting to those forms it's just it's you know the, our initial way of talking about this was you know kind of sympathy between things but but it's it's more than that it seems like a kind of uh fields of of force kind of interacting and crystallizing in a uh, a kind of an image that is intensely recognizable that you can empathize with, but no one would have ever said it that way. Um, I wanted to, uh, just before I turn it back over to you, I, I think what I was, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the experience of time in your paintings, literally and uh, imagistically. And let me, I think I tried to write it down um, so that I didn't bungle it too much. Uh, if you give me a second. Well, I, I'll, I'll summarize it this way. I, I was trying to, I kind of know enough about painting to guess how they're made, but the paintings are very thick. They're, they, they look like they have been repainted many times. Uh, so they have what you would call a physicality that suggests duration, like they they have they have uh, been built over time. Yet 
what you're almost continually uh, depicting are very fleeting moments, moments that almost you might call the the interleaving of life's experience. They're they're in between beats. They're not what you would call uh, dramatic summations of experience, but something in between. And I and I just wondered, like in making the paintings, when you are you know working them out over you know, many iterations, solving the painting problem, you know, have, you know, what's it like to try to hold on uh, to the, the compass of feeling in the work? Or is that known and is that not known until the painting is finished? It, it reveals itself in stages. In stages. Um, so I'll, uh, it, it's, it's sort of like, how can I, it's, it's, <clears throat> So <clears throat> when I develop the image on location, I'll do, I'll develop it to a point where it, I I begin to under I, I begin to kind of understand like what the color structure is or you know as as, as a sort of point of entry starting place or, or a point of departure even you know um it could, you know it could certainly be both but um <clears throat> and the paint you know. Uh, certainly is is I use I, I use a lot of paint when I paint on location. I paint very thickly, um, uh, you know, with a lot of impasto and, and but the surface, I prepare it in such a way um, so that the paint doesn't just like slip off the surface, and it allows me to um, to be uh, more of an additive painter even on location. So, um, and I also use lead, like, you know, lead in my paint, like a lead white, things like that, which help a lot <clears throat> um, because it oxidizes so fast, you know, it has this really odd way of behaving. And it's, there's just so many cool things, you know, you could do to, to alter its different state, to alter it. So it has various states of expression. Um, <clears throat> So when I bring it back to the studio, um, that's when I begin to kind of, I guess, analyze it in a more formal way. But I say formal, you know, uh, because that thing that's necessary, right? It sort of provides a structure for more of the conceptual aspects, you know. Um, and so I, I really try to like work at, because both are present, you know, um, both are present. And but they're not, they're not present fully. They're not fully present. They're just present in part. Um, <clears throat> so it's sort of enough for me to begin developing. Um, and then I just have to sort of, I have to sort of state something and then give it some space and sort of understand like, where is this going? And, you know, but like, I can't be too definitive in, in my decision-making because I, I might arrive at a conclusion that is way off too soon, right? And um, so it, it just takes time. Uh, the figures typically, they come in much, much, much later in the paintings. And you're right. Um, and it, it comes from this idea of just the psychology of the figure, how powerful a figure is and how it affects the space. So I, I very much want the figure to be an, inter an integrated um you know, part of, of the form, like the larger form of the painting, you know, and so they need, you know, the figure needs to engage the space in a way that embodies, embodies like what the actual space itself of the painting is doing. Um, and so that's, because I love what you said about the gesture, you know, um, because I, that's, that is exactly right. There's this kind of gesture, this gestural expression of form that, uh, or formal construction that I'm working towards, you know, um, sort of one, one, sort of one piece at a time, you know, and, and I, I don't like to say piece, um, because it's not like I'm working at it in parts, but maybe at one level at a time, you know, thinking about form moving or the behavior of the painting in different levels you know <clears throat> yeah i'm trying to think of artists that 
you know, because I think that's a place where you, you would be very, very different from a painter like uh, Lotterman, who I'm really much, I think of much more in terms of like geometries that he uses, although he does use very, very strange scale shifts uh, within the space. Uh, but no, the, the, the folks I think of are, are you know, like Albert Pinkham Ryder, and uh, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Stanley Spencer, especially early Stanley Spencer. Uh, Morandi would be another person where there seems to be this this animating sense of gesture that can kind of warp space in a weird way, and yeah. and, and you you really have that. Um, although, you know, again, I might ask you too, like when you're making decisions about you know, putting a horizon on it. Well, the other, uh, gosh, I forgot Soutine. I mean, Soutine would also be, you know, top of the list probably. Um, but when I think of your your decisions about how to deploy movements within a picture, whether it be a figure or a horizon or a stand of trees or a brick wall, you know, I you, you mentioned a lot about how important the color was too, like how, so and and that gets very mysterious and probably is beyond even your explaining but it seems to be both incredibly specific to a light that you felt not just saw but felt and also something deeply uh sympathetic to the color you're making like the way the color functions as an ensemble if that makes sense you know absolutely yeah Well, yeah, I'm very much, in, very much interested in, in um, uh, finding ways of of kind of pairing together uh, different. Uh, I don't know how to say this. Um, different spatial realities, you know, um, and and to have them integrate in a way that. And I, I don't know how well I, I'm able to do this yet, but to integrate it in a way that is not, I, I, I don't want to say seamless. I mean, I, I, I want it to feel that way. Um, but I also want it to not feel that way. You know, um, geez. Um, I think I know what you mean a little bit because I like, <sighs> It's, it's okay okay it's it's kind of like um i mean it's it's not quite it's not quite cubism you know uh it's it's um but when you think about what the cubists were doing and how they were building form and realizing form you know um both conceptually and formally and how they were able to how they worked to resolve that the idea of that you know visually that that that's of course you know very compelling um it's intriguing right and and so <clears throat> i think it's a way at it's, it's a way at resolving something that i think is very real in terms of the visual experience um that it is is just a very difficult thing to resolve um pictorially right so systems like well, like scientific perspective and things like that are able to help, you know, take something that is essentially, you know, impossible to really grasp, right? And and it's able to kind of neatly and mathematically able to fit into like a system, like a visual system of space, um, which is incredibly helpful. But <clears throat> I like the, the when, when you kind of, begin to pay attention to like the sense of like the sensation that space has where it's not sort of a classic pictorial spatial uh construction it's something that is like so just it's it's something that's beyond any system you know and, and it's it's like it's a fragmented but perfectly unified whole that is you know um 
and that that's something that is is it's a very it's a very mysterious thing to me. Um, and I'm and I and I I'm really trying to find a way to paint that the experience of that. So when I'm looking and you know the sensation of these different spaces and the volumes that that uh, that are there and how they're engaging with one another and how they're behaving, I'm I'm wanting to I'm wanting to work into like a visual interpretation of that. Um, and I, I use things that are representational because, well, that's for me where, you know, I can, I can work through just my life, my life story, you know, and, and sort of find, find ways to kind of get them, uh, out and get them to exist in their own way. Yeah. Well, I, I think you're succeeding magnificently, although I, you know, I think, um, uh, Peter Van Dyke uh, shared with me something he had read from a guy named Norman Turner saying that all observation-based painters are functionally cubists. That is to say that our experience of everything is, is, is a kind of weird composite that also gets run through, you know, you know, memory and, uh, and desire in some way. So, that sense of you treating every domain in the painting as something that starts to have its own domain or its own gravitational field is really kind of interesting. And it, it seems to keep, you know, I think one of the things that keeps me challenged as a viewer is trying to figure out what is the, the gradient of that gravitational field? Does it operate most at the level of you know, say some percentage of the pictorial surface. How is it playing out when I get to say a very small detail, like a, you know, a ladder or a distant boat or something like that? Uh, but it's a very alive sense of space. Maybe just another little in the weeds technical question. I understood from what you said that you you start the paintings mostly outside looking at something or you're in front of something then you bring them back into the studio it, at that point do, do you ever then go back outside again once you started working on them in the studio or do they become pretty much studio paintings after their beginnings so <clears throat> most of the time when when i've made the decision to to uh develop the painting from from the studio onward um, I will have, I, I would have established that, that it, the painting has enough visual information to sort of, um, to sort of stand on its own and, and to be, to remain the subject, to, to be the subject. Um, <clears throat> but there are times when I feel like I do that, um, maybe a little bit too soon. And so there have been paintings where I've developed and scraped down with the intention of going back um to to paint on location but you know that's that's a strange even that's a strange phrasing how does one go back right i mean it's gone like it's over <clears throat> um you know the, the question is am i willing to go into a completely and utterly new experience uh to to develop this painting again um from a subject that is similar but certainly not the same and and so sometimes you know uh of course like yeah like let's go for it you know but most of the time i won't most of the time i'll i'll just use that surface for another painting a whole different painting okay well so again not that it really matters but i'm just curious is it often the case that a single kind of engagement with something you see you know whatever that might be is enough to launch a kind of an invented enterprise. Yes. Just, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's but, really but, there, So there were, uh, I think it was 2020. I had a number of paintings that were like, like kind of medium size, you know, one was uh, boat day and the other one was boat parade. And both of those paintings were, were first started in one single session. Um, and then I, I've developed them in the studio from there. I didn't think I could, 
do that. Uh, I, I was fully intending to 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 have another session with those paintings on location, but there was just something. Whatever I was able to get when I was out there it became enough to to carry onward. It was enough material to move forward with it. Um, I didn't think that was going to happen, but but there are times when yeah, like that. Uh, swim lesson was one of those too. Like this is obviously a smaller surface, you know, but um, had one session with it out there. And this is a subject I go back to a lot. Like this, this dock, yes. uh, this sort of pier with the dock. I've made a number of paintings from this location. So there is, you know, <clears throat> there's a sense of familiarity with it. Um, but every time, you know, it's, it's, it's like you're painting just something completely different, you know, um, So yeah, so so some sorry to answer your question. Yeah, sometimes I I I, I am able to get enough in one session. Hey Brian yeah. and Scott, um, I hate to interrupt, but um, we're a little past three, and I'd love to just uh, squeeze in a few audience questions. Do it. Um, thank you so much. This was I could just keep listening. Such a good conversation. Um, okay, we have a comment from Greg, and he says. Loving that you just mentioned Soutine, though I think about him as a much faster artist. Someone else would be Vuillard. By the way, thank you for the wonderful talk. The paintings to me are a revealed and recovered clarity. And then he called them soul snapshots, which I really like. That's a great, great way to describe them. Mm. Um, this is another question. Um, she asks, for Brian, I love the multidimensionality that I can definitely sense in your paintings. I really appreciate the vulnerability of this conversation. Thank you so much. Do you have any advice for emerging artists? Thank you both for those questions. And well, Greg, the comment, uh, you know, um, it means a great deal. And um, and certainly, you know, the the content, the form of this conversation would not have even been possible, you know, Scott, uh, if, if you had not been been here doing this. So thank you so much. You brought so much, so much to this conversation, uh, Scott. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the advice that I would I would offer any emerging artist or any painter, just it's so there's so much pressure. There's so much pressure, uh, especially now with with you know the advent of, of social media technology and things like that to produce objects um, for, for admiration, you know, um, and, and to achieve like success on that, on that way. And I suppose there's always been that tendency, there's always been that pressure, but I would say it's, it's more prevalent now probably than ever. And um, with access to, to so many more images that we've ever had before, I, I would say, that it's it, it is important to be exposed to to a lot of of different types of of art and and forms and modes of expression uh pay attention to what moves you pay attention to what repulses you um both will have elements that are common and and that work with each other that will help you to kind of understand maybe more of who you are you know, as as an artist and where you lie, where your sensibilities are and your aesthetics, um, preferences and things like that. Um, do the very best you can to remain true to yourself. Uh, and even if that requires altering and changing uh, the look of something, you know, of the manner, uh, how something is expressed, um, do it. Risk whatever you have to risk. Um, because you just you don't want to end up you, you just would never want to end up as a painter as an artist who becomes bored with what they do uh without having the the grit uh and the boldness to to just the severity to kill it um and to move on um it's also important to know where to strike. You can't just like hack everything down. You you know, but you develop in, like an acute awareness of what needs to go and what can remain to develop. 
so I, I would say that I would say that and I hope that helps um you know I try not to keep it too too generalized you know but um yeah just do the very best you can to to be true to who you are as a painter as an artist that's perfect thank you so much um this question comes from Eilish they ask, could Brian say something about use of light in his paintings? Sure. Hey, Eilish. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I wish I could paint light better uh, in my in my paintings. And that's something that I am striving towards. I, I want to, I really do want to, to paint a, a better light. Um, but uh, and, but I, I feel like that has a lot to do with with better color, you know, and and I, I, I am working towards that. I'm I'm wanting to develop my color. I, I want to develop a deeper understanding of color, especially in the midtones. I there's just there's just so much there that I, I just don't understand um, that I feel like I, I really need to get to understand um, in terms of developing form developing form slowly you know um i want to to learn to develop form very very slowly um i don't i don't think about light in my paintings i know that might sound strange but i really don't think about it i think about color um And I think about value a lot. Uh, actually, Scott said this. He said that, um, and I hope I remember this correctly, Scott. He said that, you know, <clears throat> don't worry about finding the value of the color that that you're observing. If you if you get the color, you're going to get the value because every color that every color has its own its own inherent value to it, right? So. So to be able to get that, you're also going to arrive at the at, at the value as well, and I, that that helps a great deal. Um, even when I'm I'm inventing with color uh, and I'm developing it conceptually in the studio, like I'm paying a lot of attention to that. Um, my hope is that I'm consistent enough in in, in the use of and in the development of the color that there is a light that that is conveyed. You know. Um, but I, I think well, you know, I, I would say that if anything, the, the light simply becomes um a way like like the figure or some other element in the painting to describe form, to describe the movement of something and how you know how to how to sort of get space to move um and to animate, you know, in a way. So when I paint, I don't paint for the sake of light, you know, um, and I don't mean to offend anybody. I, <clears throat> I I do care about light a great deal, but I just, I relate, I arrive at it differently. Um, I, I, I tend to, to utilize it um, in a bit of a different way in terms of how it's able to reveal the behavior of form, like in, in the painting or space, you know. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to read one comment from Ben Cohen. And then before wrapping things up, I have one more request from Scott. So let me just first read um, this comment from Ben. Thanks, Brian and Scott. It's been great to listen to the conversation. I always love looking at your paintings, Brian, and I'm always surprised by the hidden spaces and figures. Amazing skill to make such slow, revealing paintings. Um, right before everyone joined us today, I was talking with Brian and Scott, and Scott um, read us a little excerpt from Faulkner, and uh. it um, it complimented Brian's paintings so beautifully, and I think that would be a great way to close. If Scott, you wouldn't mind rereading, yeah, yeah. If I won't, if I won't bore you guys too much. No, I thought I, 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 I when I looked through Brian's work for everybody out there, 
you know, he that he actually painted on Faulkner's property in Oxford, Mississippi, I think I got that right, Brian. But I had just, uh, you know, been kind of in on a little bit of a Faulkner binge this summer. And the more I looked at Brian's paintings, I was reminded very much of a a passage in this, well, it's actually a, a whole third of the novel in The Sound and the Fury, where Quentin Compson is making his way through the streets of Boston on the last day of his life. And uh, I just, all, you can almost do it on any page. You just pick up the novel, you can find it. But I found a few things that I thought were actually very beautiful as they related to Brian's work. So I'll show them out, throw them out there and Try not to butcher Faulkner's beautiful language. Here's a passage. The shadow hadn't quite cleared the stoop. I stopped inside the door watching the shadow move. It moved almost perceptibly, creeping back inside the door, driving the shadow back into the door. Here's another one. Everything was sort of violet and still. The sky green, paling into gold, beyond the gable of the house, and a plume of smoke rising from the chimney without any wind. I heard the pump again. A man was filling a pail, watching us across his pumping shoulder. There's another. The bridge was open to let a schooner through. She was in tow the tug nudging along under her quarter, trailing smoke, but the ship herself was like she was moving without visible means. A man naked to the waist was coiling down a line on the forecastle's head. His body was burned the color of leaf tobacco. And then one that I didn't read to you guys. Because father said clocks slay time, he said time is dead as long as it is being clicked off by little wheels. Only when the clock stops does time come to life. That's what your paintings feel like to me, Brian. And if I could just share one last thing that I found that I think painters will like. This is from Fairfield Porter. Um, and uh, it's really got me thinking if I can find it. This is from an interview. This is Porter speaking. He says, I have always had a feeling about shapes, not that they resembled other ones, but that they had character. I used to feel not at all unpleasantly that such inanimate objects had awareness of me, awareness without emotion, without criticism, that they knew. That is pretty weird. It's basically saying that the the shapes that a painter releases into poetry are out there and aware that they are being seen. Mm. Creepy, but beautiful. Um, I love that. Thank you so much. Give me the chills. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just love that. Yeah. Um, well, with that, thank you both so sincerely much. I thought this was just a fantastic conversation. I learned so much. It was just really incredible and poignant. And um, I love the energy between you two. It just, it was a really fruitful conversation. Oh, thank you so much. It was such a thank pleasure. You guys. Yeah, yeah, this is a gas. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, congratulations, Brian, on great work. Mm -hmm. Great work. <laughs> Brian's exhibition is on display on our website for about two more weeks. It will come to a close on Friday, April 26th. So if you have any further questions or inquiries, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and again, thank you everybody so much. Have a great weekend. All right. See you guys. Take care.